Well, like Brad said, my name is Ron, and I'm the pastor of, of community outreach here at Westside Vineyard, which is a true blessing. Get to hang out with all of those uh, servant-hearted in our community on our weekly endeavors to uh, reach out and serve our neighbors in this building, around the building, all over the West Side. Um, really amazing. But the highlight, the highlight of my week, no offense to you guys, is that I'm also the pastor of kids, elementary kids. So from four months old through fifth grade, I'm uh, the pastor of them. And that is just such a fun, amazing time. We were just dancing and they prayed over me back there. And so um, I won't make you guys dance, but it is a good way if you come, before you come to church, if you dance, it gets a blood flow into your heart to receive God's word, right? And the oxygen flow into your brain to hear it and really ap apply it to your life. That's what we tell the kids. So I, I recommend a little dance before you, before you come into church. Um, also on that note, um, we just expanded to a second service, which is pretty uh, amazing, uh, it, a game changer for some families, and that's a quote from some families. So we do have Kids Church at 9 and 11, and uh, with that, I'd just love to encourage any of you. I, I, I don't know a lot of you. I know that I've spoken to a few of you one-on-one -on -one about possibly serving as a leader in Kids Church. And um, if I haven't done that, it's probably because um, I don't know you or haven't had a chance. If that's on your heart um, at all, where you'd want to participate in leading the lives, uh, which is the future of the kingdom of God, um, come and see me anytime, anytime that that checks you. So shameless pitch over because we have to, <laughs> we have to get into the series. And like um, Brad said, we're only two weeks from Easter, that's pretty amazing, and uh, it's going to be spring this week, actually, officially, and so it's definitely in the air, spring fever is here, and um, I'm excited. I'm not wearing green today, but happy St. Patrick's Day to those of you out there. We have a couple of redheads right here in the middle, if you want to tell them St. Patrick's Day, go right ahead, so they will definitely love that. Uh, please don't pinch me um, for not wearing green, um, wouldn't be good. Um, but we are in this series called Divine Declarations, and there are seven I Am statements that Jesus um, makes, which are all recorded in the biblical book of John. And these are called, these can be called divine declarations because they are Jesus's announcements about his own divinity. The fact that he is the son of the living God, he is God in the flesh, and they reflect what God had said when he spoke to Moses in the desert thousands of years before Jesus is making these claims. So this is all the way back in the book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible. And um, God appears to Moses in a burning bush, right? So this burning bush is in flames, but it's not being engulfed by flames. So this is one of those things where you're like, okay, I need to pay attention to this. I should really listen to what is happening in this moment. This is a miracle happening before my eyes. So what God told Moses in this time was that he had something better for his people, the Israelites. He had something better for them than slavery and the persecution that they were experiencing under Egypt. And he wants Moses to be his mouthpiece. He wants Moses to be the one to um, speak this to them and to lead them to this new life that he has for them. And this conversation was actually the catalyst for Moses to go to the Egyptian king, Pharaoh, and he told him, let the Lord's people go. The Lord says, let my people go. And then we see Pharaoh's resistance to this direction. And then eventually that leads to the 10 plagues over Egypt, and this is where Passover comes from, and it's a great history there. But eventually, because of these plagues, Pharaoh can't take it anymore, and he finally says, just go, get out of Egypt, please. But before all of that could happen, Moses actually had to convince the Israelites that this mission was not from him, that it's not from any other human being. Um, it's actually from the one true living God. And so Moses says to the Lord, how am I going to do this? What should I tell them when they ask who sent me? And God said, 
I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent me to you. So very basically, I am who I am means God is everything. God is God of all. He is the one and only true living God. That's who sent you, Moses. And so he goes and tells them, and they believe, and they leave with him. So we fast forward thousands of years when Jesus is making these I am statements about himself, and he's declaring to be God in the flesh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the King of kings. And they begin with, I am the bread of life. And that's in John chapter 6. Just like the manna that God provided from heaven for the Israelites after they left Egypt while they were in the wilderness, I am the bread of life. And you might remember our, our lead pastor, Brad, he opened our series two weeks ago with this I am statement. And the statements culminate in John chapter 15 with, I am the true vine. And you might remember if you were here last week, Pastor Josh, he challenged us powerfully with that one last week. And in John chapter 8, Jesus makes arguably the strongest claim about himself up to this point. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life. So before we, get, we, we dig into this, I think it's important to note how fundamental light is to life. So I have a son who's a little over 16 years old, and I was blessed when he was born to have a job where I could work at night. So I got to spend every day with him, every morning, every afternoon. It was the most blessed season of my life to have that time with my son. And I had a three-pronged attack. I had three big goals for him. One was to love all kinds of food, because we love to eat in my family. We are eaters. If you ever hang out with us, you will know that. Number two, I wanted him to be a good athlete. So we were doing baby sit-ups on my belly when he's four months old, and he's pulling himself up. So like I said, if you know us, mission accomplished, for number one, we love to eat. He loves to eat. Number two, he's a good athlete. You would know that. And number three goal was to have his first word be daddy or dada or some kind of, I wanted to be his first word. Okay, that was my mission. So one day we're hanging out in the kitchen and he's in my arm and I'm cooking and it's a little dark in there. And so I flip on the light and he looks up at the light and he goes, lie. Light was his first word. <laughs> and I wasn't going to do this, but I have a couple pictures because I don't have a picture. My, if I showed a picture of my human son, he will not be happy. But I'm going to put a couple pictures up of my, my, one of my furry sons. And he loves the sunbeam. We'll go to the next one. There he is. You need some good, cute puppy pictures on a Sunday morning. Look, he finds the sunbeam wherever it is. He loves it. Without light, there's no life. Nico realized that when he was a baby, and puppy just lays in that sun and just loves the warmth and whatever else he receives from that. We can't have life without light, and Jesus declared that he is the light of the world. Not a light, but the light. Not enlightened, but the light of of the world. This is a radically bold claim because light was so foundational in the Old Testament. God's glory is present in light all throughout Scripture. He was that flame in the burning bush. He was a pillar of clouds by day and fire by night, leading his people, those same people we just talked about, the Israelites. He led them to the Red Sea, and they got through the Red Sea. And after that, he led them as that pillar of fire and clouds for 40 years in the wilderness before he finally landed them in the promised land. And when Jesus declared that he is the light of the world, he was saying that he is this very light himself. The pillar of fire, which was God's presence and his guidance for his people, is now here 
in the flesh. He is the saving light promised to the world, now here and present. And he made this declaration in a very intentional setting. At the time of this declaration, he was at one of these festivals that are inaugurated by God. And this one was called the Feast of the Tabernacles. And like every Jewish biblical festival, there are three aspects. First one, we're observing the holiday in the present to celebrate something God did in the past, which will help us to rekindle the anticipation of some kind of future prophetic promise hidden in each festival. So during this eight-day festival, these huge menorahs were lit in the city. Um, some records that they're 75 feet tall, and they had these giant bowls at the top, and they were full of 10 gallons of oil. And ancient accounts said that when these were lit up, they lit up all of the streets of Jerusalem. And every Jewish person knew the significance of these menorahs. They represented God's presence in that aforementioned pillar of fire and cloud, first leading them to Egypt, his presence with them and guiding them and protecting them. And what they were looking forward to was the promise of the Messiah, the savior of the world and his eventual coming. And they would, when he comes, they were looking forward to being able to celebrate this festival with all of the nations of the world. That was the anticipation that everybody would know that he was here. And at the end of the fest, the lights were purposefully extinguished. Why? Because the Messiah had not yet come. And some scholars proposed that this was the exact moment that Jesus makes this declaration. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, light also showed up a lot prophetically in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 27, verse 1. We read, the Lord, is, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? No one. Because what that means is when we trust and follow him, we experience the presence, the guidance, and the protection of the Lord. And if you want to flip to Psalm 36, verse 9, we read David right to God, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. In Jesus, we have everything we need to experience life, to have true life, to have true joy, to enjoy life in its fullest. This is the way that it was intended to be. We have that with Jesus at our fingertips. In the biblical book of Isaiah, there's a prophecy about the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world. In chapter 49, Verse 6, it says, he says, that's God, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. Too small just for that. And bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now, Isaiah was inspired to write this book by the Bible. He is a prophet, and a, and a prophet is someone who set apart by God, who can clearly hear his voice and not mix it up with his own thoughts, feelings, and desires. He unmistakably can recognize what God wants to communicate with his people, and his or her job is to communicate it with the people. And there are many prophets in the Bible who recorded God's words, and eventually there's a lot, they became books in the Bible. And there are many, many predictions, many prophecies, and Jesus fulfilled every single one of these prophecies. And that's how we know that he is the Messiah. Now, we're blessed to be on this side of all of that, right? To be on this side of the resurrection, to, to, to know all about this. But when this was playing out in Jesus' life, it was almost like these things were too good to be true for some people to believe, and that's why he intentionally made this divine declaration. When he said, I am the light of the world, he's declaring 
and proclaiming this prophecy written about him and all of the other prophecies too. And just like that verse indicates, he's not only a light for the Jewish people of Israel, but he's also a light for the Gentiles, which means every single person who's not a Jew. So everyone. He's come for us all. He's died for us all. And he is, and he always has been, and he always will be a light for us all. The light is more powerful than anything, and if we follow the light, it will lead us to our best life. Light brings clarity. Light brings comfort. It helps us gain our bearings, and it allows us to, to see our path clearly. It helps us to identify potential dangers, and it helps us to avoid them. Those are all practical uses of light. But even more important are the spiritual benefits to following the light, God. Now, we spoke briefly about that pillar of clouds and, and fire, and without that, the, the people, without that presence and guidance of God, the Israelites would not have made it. Now, that's technically speculation, but if you look at the evidence, you can see they probably would not have made it. And Jesus is declaring that the guiding presence and power of God is here now in himself. He's the light who John, the author of this book that we're looking at these divine declarations from, he writes about at the very beginning of this book. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He, him, the word, the light, they all mean Jesus. Jesus is making the divine declaration that God's power and presence is here now. And the author of this book, John, is testifying that, yes, yeah, it's true. And he's always been here since the beginning. So let's take a quick look at the beginning, the very first verse in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God created the heavens and the earth, and it was formless, and it was void, and it was dark. It's like, what is it even here for? But then we move on to chapter 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. He noticed something was missing, light. Then he created it, and he saw that it was good. He says that in Genesis. And now this thing that was formless and, and void and dark, it was starting to come together with a little bit of structure. And that good thing, it, it paved the way it made possible for other good things to be created. Land, sea, animals, the stars, the moon, flowers, vegetables, and ultimately the very good thing, as quoted in Genesis chapter 31, his very good creation, humans. Before the light, the earth was formless, seemingly without purpose, dark, but now God created the light and darkness was being overcome by light. And I think that we as humans without Jesus are like the earth without light. We have a severe void. We are formless, without direction, without purpose. Life requires light. Life requires Jesus at the center of it all. Without Jesus, we don't fully know God. And without God, we are without light. And without light, we are without true life. And without life, we are in the darkness, the void. 
the formlessness. Without Jesus, we are without the light of the world. Now, practically speaking, light awakens us to a new day, right? The sun starts creeping in and we start to wake up a little bit. That's, a, that's the practical thing that light does for us. But the light of the world awakens us to a new life. Instead of going through the motions, we can experience emotions. Instead of reacting emotionally, we can react with compassion and empathy. Instead of allowing our anger and our frustration and our loneliness and our fear to control us, we can willingly open our hearts and our souls to the fruit of God's spirit, kindness, gentleness, love, just to name a few. Now, this is all easier said than done, I know, but it is impossible without the light of the world guiding our way. Jesus is the light of the world. He is God. He's the one who brings hope. He's the one who comes to heal us. He's the one who gives us purpose, who has a great plan for our life. He is the one who makes the way for us to have a relationship with our Father, God, that lasts forever. And not just forever does not mean our time on earth. This is an, a kingdom relationship that lasts for eternity. Christ came to declare that he is the light and he loves you so much that he came and he died for you. And most of us are so quick to jump to anger and selfishness so quickly. And you know what? He still loves us in all of it. There's nothing that you or I can do to make him love us more and there's nothing that we can do to make him love us less. We matter so much to him, and we always will. And I know those, those sneaky thoughts that like to infiltrate our minds sometimes. I get them too. Maybe we think we're not good enough for a relationship with God, or, or we're not worth it to him. Nothing could be further from the truth. You are worth Jesus to God. Jesus died for you because you matter so much to him. There's another portion in that, in that book of Isaiah. The prophet, in chapter 9, verses 2 and 6, says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. That deep darkness is sometimes translated the shadow of death. Jesus was given to us by our Father God who loves us, who doesn't want us to live in that shadow of death because we matter so much to him. And on this journey to this amazing, wonderful discovery, there's a lot of barriers they're often the products of our own thoughts, our feelings and desires. Because we as humans, we're drawn to what, what looks good or what sounds good, what feels good. And a lot of the time we lack self-awareness. So another practical use of light is that it can illuminate the obstacles around us. Right, A good flashlight when we're camping in Big Bear in the summer can help us avoid a, a nasty slip or a good set of headlights on our car. We can see that pothole coming and we can do our best to try to avoid it safely. We need that light lighting that way. My other furry son, Kitty, got stepped on really hard last, the other night because I was going full force to bed and he was laying where he doesn't usually lay. <laughs> stepped on him. Bet you he wish I had my phone flashlight on at that time. <laughs> light can illuminate the obstacles surrounding us, but the light of the world helps us identify the barriers standing between us and a strong relationship with God. Same book, John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. 
Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is a toughie because this is asking us what is that that is blocking us from true connection with God? What is constantly steering us away from God's will and steering us towards our own will? This is asking us where are we purposefully planting ourselves in the dark? There might be some unspoken or secret sin that we find ourselves cycling in, trying to break free from it by our own will. And it's not so much that we're trying to hide it, but maybe we're just trying to, to deal with it ourselves and, and confess to ourselves and to heal ourselves. And then we find ourselves constantly tempted by it and falling into it again because we're trying to keep it in the dark and deal with it on our own. This could be serious addiction. This could be infidelity, nefarious things. This could be pride that we just can't let go of. This could, it, it runs the entire realm. Sin can get us in so many different ways. And it tears at our souls when we keep it in the dark. What we need to do is we need to repent, which means that we need to turn away from it because it's probably going to get exposed anyway. That which remains in the dark cannot remain hidden or unseen. The light overcomes the darkness every time. We don't, we're not sitting in, this, in, a, in a bright room and it's dark outside and we open the door and we're like, whoa, the darkness just overcame the the, the light. But if we're in a dark room, maybe we're watching a movie or we're in our hotel with the blackout curtains drawn and then you open it, it's like 10 a.m. You're like, whoa, you're overwhelmed by it. The secrecy of these things is just an illusion. Mom and dad might not know. Spouse might not know. Kids might not know. Pastor might not know. But God knows. And we know that he knows. And I believe that deep down inside, we all know that the best option for this is confession and to turn away. And this is probably going to be very difficult and even more embarrassing. But God is going to meet us right where we're at. He's going to break this off of us and he's going to heal us from the inside out. It's what he wants. He wants to shine his light on the secret sin. He wants to heal us. He wants to hear our confession. And then he wants to shower us with mercy, grace, forgiveness, love, salvation. He can heal us and restore us, but it's not magic and it's not his choice. He's already made the promise and he's going to keep it. The light of the world is here. Now we have the choice. Do we want to come into the light or do we want to stay in the darkness? It's going to expose our hearts. It's going to expose our deeds. And that's going to be so challenging. But with that light shining brightly on us, we can identify our shortcomings and we can ask the one who wants to make us whole to do just that. If we stay in the darkness, we're going to continue to be tormented and tormented more and more, and only inviting more torment. We can't avoid that distress if we're in the dark. So let's answer his call to partner with him and to be free from what has us chained fully and forever. I have one more quick point, so I'm going to call the band up now. We talked about... Light awakens us to a new day. The light of the world awakens us to a new life. Light presents us the obstacles around us while the light of the world shows us the barrier standing between us and a strong relationship with God. And a final practical nature of light is that it illuminates 
our paths, right? It, it shows us the easy way to get there. Some people have those lights on the sidewalk leading up to their door out front. Maybe we're um, on a trail, hiking trail, a little bit longer than we thought, and thank God that we have that, that flashlight with us to, you know, avoid a rattlesnake or even worse. The light of the world provides the course to pursue God's will for our lives and to walk in his spirit. There's two big directives from Jesus in the Bible. The greatest commandment and the great commission. And the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and to love his people like we love ourselves. To love the Lord and to glorify him through loving his people. The great commission is to tell as many people everywhere that Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has come to save them. God's call on our lives is to follow him, to follow that light wherever he leads, to listen to Holy Spirit who is right here, right now, just like that pillar of fire. He's present, he's guiding, he's protecting He's showing us, he's leading us the way, how to love the Lord, how to love his people, how to be witnesses that he changes everything, that he is worth everything, and how he will do that for others when they accept that invitation. The light of the world makes that path clear. He makes us aware and helps us overcome these current and potential obstacles, and he awakens us to a new life. So let's let him light us up and let's shine those lights for others as well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here among us, Lord. You are always active. You are always with us. But we pray right now that you allow us, Lord, that you help us to open our hearts to what you want for us, Jesus. Thank you for coming and declaring yourself the light of the world so that we could better understand who you are, Lord, and thank you for loving us so much that you gave your life for us. Holy Spirit, continue to remind us of this truth so that we, when we do want to lean on our own thoughts and our feelings, Lord, and we want to lean on our own will for our lives, or we want to lean on our fear, or we want to lean on our sin, or we want to lean on our loneliness, Lord. That the only true thing, the only true one, the only true light, Lord, is you. So help us to remember to lean on you, to turn to you. Thank you for your love and your guiding light, Lord. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your guidance. Jesus, we love you so much. And it's in your name and for your glory that we pray. Amen. If you're able, please join me and rise for our last song.